The Greek State and Other Fragments. Translated by Maximilian A. Mug. Preface to an Unwritten Book. Contents. Translator's Preface. The Greek State. The Greek Woman. On Music and Words. Translator's Preface. The essays contained in this volume treat of various subjects. With the exception of perhaps one we must consider all these papers as fragments, written during the early 70s, and intended mostly as prefaces, they are extremely interesting, since traces of Nietzsche's later tenets, like slave and master morality, the superman, can be found everywhere. But they are also very valuable on account of the young philosopher's daring and able handling of difficult and abstruse subjects. Truth and falsity, and the Greek woman are probably the two essays which will prove most attractive to the average reader. In the essay on the Greek state the two tenets mentioned above are clearly discernible, though the superman still goes by the scope and herein label genius. Our philosopher attacks the modern ideas of the dignity of man and of the dignity of labor, because existence seems to be without worth and dignity. The preponderance of such illusory ideas is due to the political power nowadays vested in their slaves. The Greeks saw no dignity in labor. They saw the necessity of it, and the necessity of slavery, but felt ashamed of both. Not even the labor of the artist did they admire, although they praised his completed work. If the Greeks perished through their slavery, one thing is still more certain, we shall perish through the lack of slavery. To the essence of culture slavery is innate. It is part of it. A vast multitude must labor and slave in order that a few may lead an existence devoted to beauty and art. Strife and war are necessary for the welfare of the state. War consecrates and purifies the state. The purpose of the military state is the creating of the military genius, the ruthless conqueror, the warlord. There also exists a mysterious connection between the state in general and the creating of the genius. In the Greek or woman, Nietzsche, the man who said, one cannot think highly enough of women, delineates his ideal of woman. Penelope, Antigone, Electra are his ideal types. Plato's dictum that in the perfect state the family would cease to exist, belongs to the most intimate things uttered about the relation between women and the state. The Greek woman as mother had to vegetate in obscurity, to lead a kind of Cranfordian existence for the greater welfare of the body politic. Only in Greek antiquity did woman occupy her proper position, and for this reason she was more honored than she has ever been since. Pythia was the mouthpiece, the symbol of Greek unity. On music and words. Music is older, more fundamental than language. Music is an expression of cosmic consciousness. Language is only a gesture symbolism. It is true the music of every people was at first allied to lyric poetry, absolute music always appeared much later. But that is due to the double nature in the essence of language. The tone of the speaker expresses the basic pleasure and displeasure sensations of the individual. These form the tonal subsoil common to all languages, they are comprehensible everywhere. Language itself is a superstructure on that subsoil, it is a gesture symbolism for all the other conceptions which man adds to that subsoil. The endeavor to illustrate a poem by music is futile. The text of an opera is therefore quite negligible. Modern opera in its music is therefore often only a stimulant or a remembrance of a set, stereotyped feelings. Great music, i.e., Dionysian music, makes us forget to listen to the words. Homer's Contest. The Greek genius acknowledged strife, struggle, contest to be necessary in this life. Only through competition and emulation will the commonwealth thrive. Yet there was no unbridled ambition. Everyone's individual endeavors were subordinated to the welfare of the community. The curse of present day contest is that it does not do the same. In the relation of Schopenhauer's philosophy to a German culture an amusing and yet serious attack is made on the hollow would-be culture of the German Philistines who after the Franco-Prussian war were swollen with self-conceit, self-sufficiency, and were a great danger to real culture. 
Nietzsche points out Schopenhauer's great philosophy as the only possible means of escaping the humdrum of Philistia with its hypocrisy and intellectual ostracization. The Essay on Greek Philosophy during the tragic age is a performance of great interest to the scholar. It brims with ideas. The Hegelian school, especially Zeller, has shown what an important place is held by the earlier thinkers in the history of Greek thought and how necessary a knowledge of their work is for all who wish to understand Plato and Aristotle. Deal's great book, Die Fragmenti de Vor Socratica, Ben S. Bernites and Fairbanks books we may regard as the peristyle through which we enter the temple of early Greek philosophy. Nietzsche's essay then is like a beautiful festoon swinging between the columns erected by Deals and the others out of the marble of facts. Beauty and the personal equation are the two leitmotiv of Nietzsche's history of the pre-Socratian philosophers. Especially does he lay stress upon the personal equation, since that is the only permanent item of interest, considering that every system crumbles into nothing with the appearance of a new thinker. In this way Nietzsche treats of Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, Parmenides, Xenophanes, Anaxagoras. There are also some sketches of a draft for an intended but never accomplished continuation, in which Empedocles, Democritus and Plato were to be dealt with. Probably the most popular of the essays in this book will prove to be the one on truth and falsity. It is an epistemological rhapsody on the relativity of truth, on appearance and reality, on Perceptual flux versus conceptual conceit. Man's intellect is only a means in the struggle for existence, a means taking the place of the animal's horns and teeth. It adapts itself especially to deception and dissimulation. There are no absolute truths. Truth is relative and always imperfect. Yet fictitious values fixed by convention and utility are set down as truth. The liar does not use these standard coins of the realm. He is hated, not out of love for truth, no, but because he is dangerous. Our words never hit the essence, the X of thing, but indicate only external characteristics. Language is the columbarium of the ideas, the cemetery of perceptions. Truths are metaphors, illusions anthropomorphisms about which one has forgotten that they are such. There are different truths to different beings. Like a spider-man sits in the web of his truths and ideas. He wants to be deceived. By means of error he mostly lives, truth is often fatal. When the liar, the storyteller, the poet, the rhapsodist lie to him without hurting him he, loves them. The text underlying this translation is that of volume I of the Tashkin Osgarb. One or two obscure passages I hope my conjectures may have elucidated. The dates following the titles indicate the year when these essays were written. In no other work have I felt so deeply the great need of the science of signifies with its ultimate international standardization of terms, as attempted by Isler and Baldwin. I hope, however, I have succeeded in conveying accurately the meaning of the author in spite of a certain looseness in his philosophical terminology. The English language is somewhat at a disadvantage through its lack of noun infinitive. I can best illustrate this by a passage from Parmenides. In his usual masterly manner Deals translates these lines with, Das Sergen und Denken muss sein Seins sein. Den das Sinn existiert, das Nichts existiert nicht. Das heißt sich die Qual zubehutzigen. On the other hand in Fairbanks' version we read, it is necessary both to say and to think that being is, for it is possible that being is, and it is impossible that not being is, this is what I bid thee ponder. In order to avoid a similar obscurity, throughout the paper on early Greek philosophy I have rendered das say and, to ebb, with existent, das nicht say and with non-existent, das sein emu, with being and das nicht sein with not being. I am directly or indirectly indebted for many suggestions to several friends of mine, especially to two of my colleagues, J. Charlton Hipkins, M. A., and R. Miller, Bachelor of Arts, for their patient revision of the whole of the proofs. M. A. Mug. London, 
July 1911. The Greek State. Preface to an Unwritten Book, 1871. We moderns have an advantage over the Greeks in two ideas, which are given as it were as a compensation to a world behaving thoroughly slavishly and yet at the same time anxiously eschewing the word slave, we talk of the dignity of man and of the dignity of labor. Everybody worries in order miserably to perpetuate a miserable existence, this awful need compels him to consuming labor, man, or, more exactly, the human intellect seduced by the will now occasionally marvels at labor as something dignified. However in order that labor might have a claim on titles of honor, it would be necessary above all, that existence itself, to which labor after all is only a painful means, should have more dignity and value than it appears to have had, up to the present, to serious philosophies and religions. What else may we find in the labor need of all the millions but the impulse to exist at any price? the same all-powerful impulse by which stunted plants stretch their roots through earthless rocks. Out of this awful struggle for existence only individuals can emerge, and they are at once occupied with the noble phantoms of artistic culture, lest they should arrive at practical pessimism, which nature abhors as her exact opposite. In the modern world, which, compared with the Greek, usually produces only abnormalities and centaurs, in which the individual, like that fabulous creature in the beginning of the Horatian art of poetry, is jumbled together out of pieces, here in the modern world in one and the same man the greed of the struggle for existence and the need for art show themselves at the same time, out of this unnatural amalgamation has originated the dilemma, to excuse and to consecrate that first greed before this need for art. Therefore, we believe in the dignity of man and the dignity of labor. The Greeks did not require such conceptual hallucinations, for among them the idea that labor is a disgrace is expressed with startling frankness, and another piece of wisdom, more hidden and less articulate, but everywhere alive, added that the human thing also was an ignominious and piteous nothing and the dream of a shadow. Labor is a disgrace, because existence has no value in itself. But even though this very existence in the alluring embellishment of artistic illusions shines forth and really seems to have a value in itself, then that proposition is still valid that labor is a disgrace, a disgrace indeed by the fact that it is impossible for man, fighting for the continuance of bare existence, to become an artist. In modern times it is not the art needing man but the slave who determines the general conceptions the slave who according to his nature must give deceptive names to all conditions in order to be able to live. Such phantoms as the dignity of man, the dignity of labor, are the needy products of slavedom hiding itself from itself. Waffle time, in which the slave requires such conceptions, in which he is incited to think about and beyond himself. Cursed seducers, who have destroyed the slave's state of innocence by the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Now the slave must vainly scrape through from one day to another with transparent lies recognizable to every one of deeper insight, such as the alleged equal rights of all or the so-called fundamental rights of man, of man as such, or the dignity of labor. Indeed he is not to understand at what stage and at what height dignity can first be mentioned, namely, at the point, where the individual goes wholly beyond himself and no longer has to work and to produce in order to preserve his individual existence. And even on this height of labor the Greek at times is overcome by a feeling, that looks like shame. In one place Plutarch with earlier Greek instinct says that no nobly born youth on beholding the Zeus in Pisa would have the desire to become himself a Phidias, or on seeing the hearer in Argos, to become himself a Polyclet, and just as little would he wish to be an Acreon, Philtus or Archilosius, however much he might revel in their poetry. To the Greek the work of the artist falls just as much under the undignified conception of labor as any ignoble craft. But if the compelling force of the artistic impulse operates in him, then he must produce and submit himself to that need of labor. And as a father admires the beauty and the gift of his child but thinks of the act of procreation with shame-faced dislike, so it was with the Greek. The joyful astonishment at the beautiful has not blinded him as to its origin which appeared to him, 
like all becoming in nature, to be a powerful necessity, a forcing of itself into existence. That feeling by which the process of procreation is considered as something shamefacedly to be hidden, although by it man serves a higher purpose than his individual preservation, the same feeling veiled also the origin of the great works of art, in spite of the fact that through them a higher form of existence is inaugurated, just as through that other act comes a new generation. The feeling of shame seems therefore to occur where man is merely a tool of manifestations of will infinitely greater than he is permitted to consider himself in the isolated shape of the individual. Now we have the general idea to which are to be subordinated the feelings which the Greek had with regard to labor and slavery. Both were considered by them as a necessary disgrace, of which one feels ashamed, as a disgrace and as a necessity at the same time. In this feeling of shame is hidden the unconscious discernment that the real aim needs those conditional factors, but that in that need lies the fearful and beast of prey-like quality of the sphinx nature who in the glorification of the artistically free culture life so beautifully stretches forth her virgin body. Culture, which is chiefly a real need for art, rests upon a terrible basis, the latter however makes itself known in the twilight sensation of shame. In order that there may be a broad, deep, and fruitful soil for the development of art, the enormous majority must, in the service of a minority, be slavishly subjected to life's struggle, to a greater degree than their own wants necessitate. At their cost, through the surplus of their labor, that privileged class is to be relieved from the struggle for existence, in order to create and to satisfy a new world of want. Accordingly we must accept this cruel sounding truth, that slavery is of the essence of culture, a truth of course, which leaves no doubt as to the absolute value of existence. This truth is the vulture that gnaws at the liver of the Promethean promoter of culture. The misery of toiling men must still increase in order to make the production of the world of art possible to a small number of Olympian men. Here is to be found the source of that secret wrath nourished by communists and socialists of all times, and also by their feebler descendants, the white race of the liberals, not only against the arts, but also against classical antiquity. If culture really rested upon the will of a people, if here inexorable powers did not rule, powers which are law and barrier to the individual, then the contempt for culture, the glorification of a poorness in spirit, the iconoclastic annihilation of artistic claims would be more than an insurrection of the suppressed masses against drone-like individuals, it would be the cry of compassion tearing down the walls of culture, the desire for justice, for the equalization of suffering would swamp all other ideas. In fact here and there sometimes an exuberant degree of compassion has for a short time opened all the floodgates of culture life, a rainbow of compassionate love and of peace peered with the first radiant rise of Christianity and under it was born Christianity's most beautiful fruit, the gospel according to Saint John. But there are also instances to show that powerful religions for long periods petrify a given degree of culture and cut off with inexorable sickle everything that still grows on strongly and luxuriantly. For it is not to be forgotten that the same cruelty, which we found in the essence of every culture, lies also in the essence of every powerful religion and in general in the essence of power, which is always evil, so that we shall understand it just as well, when a culture is shattering, with a cry for liberty or at least justice, a too highly piled bulwark of religious claims that which in this sorry scheme of things will live, i.e., must live, is at the bottom of its nature a reflex of the primal pain and primal contradiction, and must therefore strike our eyes, an organ fashioned for this world and earth. As an insatiable greed for existence and an eternal self-contradiction, within the form of time, therefore as becoming, every moment devours the preceding one, Every birth is the death of innumerable beings, begetting, living, murdering, all is one. Therefore we may compare this grand culture with a blood-stained victor, who in his triumphal procession carries the defeated along as slaves chained to his chariot, slaves whom a beneficent power has so blinded that, almost crushed by the wheels of the chariot, they nevertheless still exclaim, Dignity of Labor.
dignity of man. The voluptuous Cleopatra culture throws ever again the most priceless pearls, the tears of compassion for the misery of slaves, into her golden goblet. Out of the emasculation of modern man has been born the enormous social distress of the present time, not out of the true and deep commiseration for that misery, and if it should be true that the Greeks perished through their slavedom then another fact is much more certain, that we shall perish through the lack of slavery. Slavedom did not appear in any way objectionable, much less abominable, either to early Christianity or to the Germanic race. What an uplifting effect on us has the contemplation of the medieval bondman, with his legal and moral relations, relations that were inwardly strong and tender, towards the man of higher rank, with the profound fencing in of his narrow existence, how uplifting, and how reproachful. He who cannot reflect upon the position of affairs in society without melancholy, who has learned to conceive of it as the continual painful birth of those privileged culture men, in whose service everything else must be devoured, he will no longer be deceived by that false glamour, which the moderns have spread over the origin and meaning of the state. For what can the state mean to us, if not the means by which that social process described just now is to be fused and to be guaranteed in its unimpeded continuance? Be the sociable instinct in individual man as strong as it may, it is only the iron clamp of the state that constrains the large masses upon one another in such a fashion that a chemical decomposition of society, with its pyramid-like superstructure, is bound to take place. Whence however originates this sudden power of the state, whose aim lies much beyond the insight and beyond the egoism of the individual? How did the slave, the blind mole of culture, originate? The Greeks in their instinct relating to the law of nations have betrayed it to us, in an instinct, which even in the ripest fullness of their civilization and humanity never ceased to utter as out of a brazen mouth such words as, to the victor belongs the vanquished, with wife and child, life and property. Power gives the first right, and there is no right, which at bottom is not presumption, usurpation, violence. Here again we see with what pitiless inflexibility nature, in order to arrive at society, forges for herself the cruel tool of the state, namely, that conqueror with the iron hand, who is nothing else than the objectivation of the instinct indicated. By the indefinable greatness and power of such conquerors the spectator feels, that they are only the means of an intention manifesting itself through them and yet hiding itself from them. The weaker forces attach themselves to them with such mysterious speed, and transform themselves so wonderfully, in the sudden swelling of that violent avalanche, under the charm of that creative kernel, into an affinity hitherto not existing, that it seems as if a magic will were emanating from them. Now when we see how little the vanquished trouble themselves after a short time about the horrible origin of the state so that history informs us of no class of events worse than the origins of those sudden, violent, bloody and, at least in one point, inexplicable usurpations, when hearts involuntarily go out towards the magic of the growing state with the presentiment of an invisible deep purpose, where the calculating intellect is enabled to see an addition of forces only, when now the state is even contemplated with fervor as the goal and ultimate aim of the sacrifices and duties of the individual, then out of all that speaks the enormous necessity of the state, without which nature might not succeed in coming, through society, to her deliverance in semblance, in the mirror of the genius. What discernment does the instinctive pleasure in the state not overcome? One would indeed feel inclined to think that a man who, looks into the origin of the state will henceforth seek his salvation at an awful distance from it, and where can one not see the monuments of its origin, devastated lands, destroyed cities, brutalized men, devouring hatred of nations. The state, of ignominiously low birth, for the majority of men a continually flowing source of hardship, at frequently recurring periods the consuming torch of mankind, and yet a word, at which we forget ourselves, a battle cry, which has filled men with enthusiasm for innumerable really heroic deeds, 
perhaps the highest and most venerable object for the blind and egoistic multitude which only in the tremendous moments of state life has the strange expression of greatness on its face. We have, however, to consider the Greeks, with regard to the unique sun height of their art, as their political men in themselves, and certainly history knows of no second instance of such an awful unchaining of the political passion such an unconditional immolation of all other interests in the service of this state instinct, at the best one might distinguish the men of the Renaissance in Italy with a similar title for like reasons and by way of comparison. So overloaded is that passion among the Greeks that it begins ever anew to rage against itself and to strike its teeth into its own flesh. This bloody jealousy of city against city, of party against party, this murderous greed of those little wars, the tiger-like triumph over the corpse of the slain enemy, in short, the incessant renewal of those Trojan scenes of struggle and horror, in the spectacle of which, as a genuine Hellene, Homer stands before us absorbed with delight. Whither does this naive barbarism of the Greek state point? What is its excuse before the tribunal of eternal justice? Proud and calm. The state steps before this tribunal and by the hand it leads the flower of blossoming womanhood, Greek society. For this Helena the state waged those wars, and what grey-bearded judge could here condemn? Under this mysterious connection, which we here divine between state and art, political greed and artistic creation, battlefield and work of art, we understand by the state, as already remarked, only the cramp iron which compels the social process, whereas without the state, in the natural bellum omnium contra omnes society cannot strike root at all on a larger scale and beyond the reach of the family. Now, after states have been established almost everywhere, the bent of the bellum omnium contra omnes concentrates itself from time to time into a terrible gathering of war clouds and discharges itself as it were in rare but so much the more violent shocks and lightning flashes. But in consequence of the effect of that bellum, an effect which is turned inwards and compressed, society is given time during the intervals to germinate and burst into leaf, in order, as soon as warmer days come, to let the shining blossoms of genius sprout forth. In face of the political world of the Helens, I will not hide those phenomena at the present in which I believe I discern dangerous atrophies of the political sphere equally critical for art and society. If there should exist men, who as it were through birth are placed outside the national and state instincts, who consequently have to esteem the state only in so far as they conceive that it coincides with their own interest, then such men will necessarily imagine as the ultimate political aim the most undisturbed collateral existence of great political communities possible, in which they might be permitted to pursue their own purposes without restriction. With this idea in their heads they will promote that policy which will offer the greatest security to these purposes, whereas it is unthinkable, that they, against their intentions, guided perhaps by an unconscious instinct, should sacrifice themselves for the state tendency, unthinkable because they lack that very instinct. All other citizens of the state are in the dark about what nature intends with her state instinct within them, and they follow blindly. Only those who stand outside this instinct know what they want from the state and what the state is to grant them. Therefore it is almost unavoidable that such men should gain great influence in the state because they are allowed to consider it as a means, whereas all the others under the sway of those unconscious purposes of the state are themselves only means for the fulfillment of the state purpose. In order now to attain, through the medium of the state, the highest furtherance of their selfish aims, it is above all necessary, that the state be wholly freed from those awfully incalculable war convulsions so that it may be used rationally, and thereby they strive with all their might for a condition of things in which war is an impossibility. For that purpose the thing to do is first to curtail and to enfeeble the political separatisms and factions and through the establishment of large equipoised state bodies and the mutual safeguarding of them to make the successful result of an aggressive war and consequently war itself the greatest improbability, as on the other hand they will endeavour to wrest the question of war and peace from the decision of individual lords, 
in order to be able rather to appeal to the egoism of the masses or their representatives, for which purpose they again need slowly to dissolve the monarchic instincts of the nations. This purpose they attain best through the most general promulgation of the liberal optimistic view of the world, which has its roots in the doctrines of French rationalism and the French Revolution, i.e., in a wholly un-Germanic, genuinely neo-Latin slow and unmetaphysical philosophy. I cannot help seeing in the prevailing international movements of the present day, and the simultaneous promulgation of universal suffrage, the effects of the fear of war above everything else, yea I behold behind these movements, those truly international homeless money hermits, as the really alarmed, who, with their natural lack of the state instinct, have learnt to abuse politics as a means of the exchange, and state and society as an apparatus for their own enrichment. Against the deviation of the state tendency into a money tendency, to be feared from this side, the only remedy is war and once again war, in the emotions of which this at least becomes obvious, that the state is not founded upon the fear of the war demon, as a protective institution for egoistic individuals, but in love to fatherland and prince, it produces an ethical impulse, indicative of a much higher destiny. If I therefore designate as a dangerous and characteristic sign of the present political situation the application of revolutionary thought in the service of a selfish stateless money aristocracy, if at the same time I conceive of the enormous dissemination of liberal optimism as the result of modern financial affairs fallen into strange hands, and if I imagine all evils of social conditions together with the necessary decay of the arts to have either germinated from that root or grown together with it, one will have to pardon my occasionally chanting a pian on war. Horribly clangs its silvery bow, and although it comes along like the night, war is nevertheless Apollo the true divinity for consecrating and purifying the state. First of all, however, as is said in the beginning of the Iliad, he lets fly his arrow on the mules and dogs. Then he strikes the men themselves, and everywhere buyers break into flames. Be it then pronounced that war is just as much a necessity for the state as the slave is for society, and who can avoid this verdict if he honestly asks himself about the causes of the never equalled Greek art perfection? He who contemplates war and its uniformed possibility, the soldier's profession, with respect to the hitherto described nature of the state, must arrive at the conviction, that through war and in the profession of arms is placed before our eyes an image, or even perhaps the prototype of the state. Here we see as the most general effect of the war tendency an immediate decomposition and division of the chaotic mass into military castes, out of which rises, pyramid shaped, on an exceedingly broad base of slaves the edifice of the martial society. The unconscious purpose of the whole movement constrains every individual under its yoke, and produces also in heterogeneous natures as it were a chemical transformation of their qualities until they are brought into affinity with that purpose. In the highest castes one perceives already a little more of what in this internal process is involved at the bottom, namely the creation of the military genius, with whom we have become acquainted as the original founder of states. In the case of many states, as, for example, in the Lycogen constitution of Sparta, one can distinctly perceive the impress of that fundamental idea of the state, that of the creation of the military genius. If we now imagine the military primal state in its greatest activity, at its proper labor, and if we fix our glance upon the whole technique of war, we cannot avoid correcting our notions picked up from everywhere, as to the dignity of man and the dignity of labor by the question whether the idea of dignity is applicable also to that labor, which has as its purpose the destruction of the dignified man, as well as to the man who is entrusted with that dignified labor, or whether in this warlike task of the state those mutually contradictory ideas do not neutralize one another. I should like to think there. Warlike man to be a means of the military genius and his labor again only a tool in the hands of that same genius, and not to him as absolute man and non-genius, but to him as a means of the genius, whose pleasure also can be to choose his tool's destruction as a mere pawn sacrificed on the strategist's chessboard, is due a degree of dignity, of that dignity namely, 
to have been deemed worthy of being a means of the genius. But what is shown here in a single instance is valid in the most general sense, every human being, with his total activity, only has dignity in so far as he is a tool of the genius, consciously or unconsciously, from this we may immediately deduce the ethical conclusion, that man in himself, the absolute man possesses neither dignity, nor rights, nor duties, only as a wholly determined being serving unconscious purposes can man excuse his existence. Plato's perfect state is according to these considerations certainly something still greater than even the warm-blooded among his admirers believe, not to mention the smiling mean of superiority with which our historically educated refuse such a fruit of antiquity. The proper aim of the state the Olympian existence and ever renewed procreation and preparation of the genius, compared with which all other things are only tools, expedients and factors towards realization, is here discovered with a poetic intuition and painted with firmness. Plato saw through the awfully devastated Hamar of the then existing state life and perceived even then something divine in its interior. He believed that one might be able to take out this divine image and that the grim and barbarically distorted outside and shell did not belong to the essence of the state, the whole fervor and sublimity of his political passion threw itself upon this belief, upon that desire, and in the flames of this fire he perished. That in his perfect state he did not place at the head the genius in its general meaning, but only the genius of wisdom and of knowledge that he altogether excluded the inspired artist from his state, that was a rigid consequence of the secretion judgment on art, which Plato, struggling against himself, had made his own. This more external, almost incidental gap must not prevent our recognizing in the total conception of the Platonic state the wonderfully great hieroglyph of a profound and eternally to be interpreted esoteric doctrine of the connection between state and genius. What we believed we could divine of this cryptograph we have said in this preface. The Greek Woman. Fragment, 1871. Just as Plato from disguises and obscurities brought to light the innermost purpose of the state, so also he conceived the chief cause of the position of the Hellenic woman with regard to the state, in both cases he saw in what existed around him the image of the ideas manifested to him, and of these ideas of course the actual was only a hazy picture and phantasmagoria. He who according to the usual custom considers the position of the Hellenic woman to be altogether unworthy and repugnant to humanity, must also turn with this reproach against the platonic conception of this position, for, as it were, the existing forms were only precisely set forth in this latter conception. Here therefore our question repeats itself. Should not the nature and the position of the Hellenic woman have a necessary relation to the goals of the Hellenic will? Of course there is one side of the Platonic conception of woman, which stands in abrupt contrast with Hellenic custom, Plato gives to woman a full share in the rights, knowledge and duties of man, and considers woman only as the weaker sex, in that she will not achieve remarkable success in all things, without however disputing this sex's title to all those things. We must not attach more value to this strange notion than to the expulsion of the artist out of the ideal state, these are sidelines daringly must drawn, aberrations as it were of the hand otherwise so sure and of the so calmly contemplating eye which at times under the influence of the deceased master becomes dim and dejected, in this mood he exaggerates the master's paradoxes and in the abundance of his love gives himself satisfaction by very eccentrically intensifying the latter's doctrines even to foolhardiness. The most significant word however that Plato as a Greek could say on the relation of woman to the state, was that so objectionable demand, that in the perfect state, the family was to cease. At present let us take no account of his abolishing even marriage in order to carry out this demand fully, and of his substituting solemn nuptials arranged by order of the state, between the bravest men and the noblest women, for the attainment of beautiful offspring. In that principal proposition however he has indicated most distinctly, indeed too distinctly, offensively distinctly, an important preparatory step of the Hellenic will towards the procreation of the genius. 
but in the customs of the Hellenic people the claim of the family on man and child was extremely limited. The man lived in the state, the child grew up for the state and was guided by the hand of the state. The Greek will took care that the need of culture could not be satisfied in the seclusion of a small circle. From the state the individual has to receive everything in order to return everything to the state. Woman accordingly means to the state, what sleep does to man. In her nature lies the healing power, which replaces that which has been used up, the beneficial rest in which everything immoderate confines itself, the eternal same, by which the excessive and the surplus regulate themselves. In her the future generation dreams. Woman is more closely related to nature than man and in all her essentials she remains ever herself. Culture is with her always something external, a something which does not touch the kernel that is eternally faithful to nature, therefore the culture of woman might well appear to the Athenian as something indifferent, yea, if one only wanted to conjure it up in one's mind, as something ridiculous. He who at once feels himself compelled from that to infer the position of women among the Greeks as unworthy and all too cruel, should not indeed take as his criterion there culture of modern woman and her claims, against which it is sufficient just to point out the Olympian women together with Penelope, Antigone, Electra. Of course it is true that these are ideal figures, but who would be able to create such ideals out of the present world? Further indeed is to be considered what sons these women have borne, and what women they must have been to have given birth to such sons. The Hellenic woman as mother had to live in obscurity because the political instinct together with its highest aim demanded it. She had to vegetate like a plant, in the narrow circle, as a symbol of the Epicurean wisdom comma as. Again, in more recent times, with the complete disintegration of the principle of the state, she had to step in as helper, the family as a makeshift for the state is her work, and in this sense the artistic aim of the state had to abase itself to the level of a domestic art. Thereby it has been brought about, that the passion of love, as the one realm wholly accessible to women, regulates our art to the very core. Similarly, home education considers itself so to speak as the only natural one and suffers state education only as a questionable infringement upon the right of home education, all this is right as far as the modern state only is concerned. With that the nature of woman with all remains unaltered, but her power is, according to the position which the state takes up with regard to women, a different one. Women have indeed really the power to make good to a certain extent the deficiencies of the state, ever faithful to their nature, which I have compared to sleep. In Greek antiquity they held that position, which the most supreme will of the state assigned to them, for that reason they have been glorified as never since. The goddesses of Greek mythology are their images, the Pythia and the Sibyl as well as the Socratic diatoma are the priestesses out of whom divine wisdom speaks. Now one understands why the proud resignation of the Spartan woman at the news of her son's death in battle can be no fable. Woman in relation to the state felt herself in her proper position, therefore she had more dignity than woman has ever had since. Plato who through abolishing family and marriage still intensifies the position of woman, feels now so much reverence towards them, that oddly enough he is misled by a subsequent statement of their equality with man, to abolish again the order of rank which is their due, the highest triumph of the woman of antiquity, to have seduced even the wisest. As long as the state is still in an embryonic condition woman as mother preponderates and determines the grade in the manifestations of culture, in the same way as woman is destined to complement the disorganized state. What Tacitus says of German women, in Asquinetam Sanctum. Aliquidet providum putant ne court concilia ere mass pernentiur ought responds an igelgunt, applies on the whole to all nations not yet arrived at the real state. In such stages one feels only the more strongly that which at all times becomes again manifest, that the instincts of woman as the bulwark of the future generation are invincible and that in her care for the preservation of the species nature speaks out of these instincts very distinctly. How far this divining power reaches is determined, it seems, by the greater or lesser consolidation of the state, in disorderly and more arbitrary conditions. 
where the whim or the passion of the individual man carries along with itself whole tribes, then woman suddenly comes forward as the warning prophetess. But in Greece too there was never slumbering care that the terribly overcharged political instinct might splinter into dust and atoms the little political organisms before they attain their goals in any way. Here the Hellenic will created for itself ever new implements by means of which it spoke, adjusting, moderating, warning, above all it is in the Pythia, that the power of woman to compensate the state manifested itself so clearly, as it has never done since. That a people split up thus into small tribes and municipalities, was yet at bottom whole and was performing the task of its nature within its faction, was assured by that wonderful phenomenon the Pythia and the Delphian oracle, for always, as long as Hellenism created its great works of art, it spoke out of one mouth and as one Pythia. We cannot hold back the portentous discernment that to the will individuation means much suffering, and that in order to reach those individuals it needs an enormous stepladder of individuals. It is true our brains reel with the consideration whether the will in order to arrive at art, has perhaps effused itself out into these worlds, stars, bodies, and atoms, at least it ought to become clear to us then, that art is not necessary for the individuals, but for the will itself, a sublime outlook at which we shall be permitted to glance once more from another position. On Music and Words Fragment, 1871 What we here have asserted of the relationship between language and music must be valid too for equal reasons concerning the relationship of mime to music. The mime too, as the intensified symbolism of man's gestures, is, measured by the eternal significance of music, only a simile, which brings into expression the innermost secret of music but very superficially, namely on the substratum of the passionately moved human body. But if we include language also in the category of bodily symbolism, and compare the drama, according to the canon advanced, with music, then I venture to think, a proposition of Schopenhauer will come into the clearest light, to which reference must be made again later on. It might be admissible, although a purely musical mind does not demand it, to join and adapt words or even a clearly represented action to the pure language of tones, although the latter, being self-sufficient, needs no help so that our perceiving and reflecting intellect, which does not like to be quite idle, may meanwhile have light and analogous occupation also. By this concession to the intellect man's attention adheres even more closely to music, by this at the same time, too, is placed underneath that which the tones indicate in their general metaphorous language of the heart, a visible picture, as it were a schema, as an example illustrating a general idea. Indeed such things will even heighten the effect of music. Schopenhauer, Per Eger, 2, On the Metaphysics of the Beautiful and Aesthetics, section 224, if we disregard the naturalistic external motivation according to which our perceiving and reflecting intellect does not like to be quite idle when listening to music, and attention led by the hand of an obvious action follows better. Then the drama in relation to music has been characterized by Schopenhauer for the best reasons as a schema, as an example illustrating a general idea, and when he adds indeed such things will even heighten the effect of music then the enormous universality and originality of vocal music, of the connection of tone with metaphor and idea guarantee the correctness of this utterance. The music of every people begins in closest connection with lyricism and long before absolute music can be thought of, the music of a people in that connection passes through the most important stages of development. If we understand this primal lyricism of a people, as indeed we must, to be an imitation of the artistic typifying nature, then as the original prototype of that union of music and lyricism must be regarded, the duality in the essence of language, already typified by nature. Now, after discussing the relation of music to metaphor we will fathom deeper this essence of language. In the multiplicity of languages the fact at once manifests itself, that word and thing do not necessarily coincide with one another completely, but that the word is a symbol. But what does the word symbolize? Most certainly only conceptions 
be these now conscious ones are as in the greater number of cases, unconscious, for how should a word symbol correspond to that innermost nature of which we and the world are images? Only as conceptions we know that kernel, only in its metaphorical expressions are we familiar with it, beyond that point there is nowhere a direct bridge which could lead us to it. The whole life of impulses, too, the play of feelings, sensations, emotions, volitions, is known to us, as I am forced to insert here in opposition to Schopenhauer, after a most rigid self-examination, not according to its essence but merely as conception, and we may well be permitted to say, that even Schopenhauer's will is nothing else but the most general phenomenal form of a something otherwise absolutely indecipherable. If therefore we must acquiesce in the rigid necessity of getting nowhere beyond the conceptions we can nevertheless again distinguish two main species within their realm. The one species manifest themselves to us as pleasure and displeasure sensations and accompany all other conceptions as a never lacking fundamental basis. This most general manifestation, out of which and by which alone we understand all becoming and all willing and for which we will retain the name will has now too in language its own symbolic sphere, and in truth this sphere is equally fundamental to the language, as that manifestation is fundamental to all other conceptions. All degrees of pleasure and displeasure. Expressions of one primal cause unfathomable to us symbolize themselves in the tone of the speaker, whereas all the other conceptions are indicated by the gesture symbolism of the speaker. In so far as that primal cause is the same in all men, the tonal subsoil is also the common one, comprehensible beyond the difference of language. Out of it now develops the more arbitrary gesture symbolism which is not wholly adequate for its basis, and with which begins the diversity of languages whose multiplicity we are permitted to consider, to use a simile, as a strophic text to that primal melody of the pleasure and displeasure language. The whole realm of the consonantal and vocal we believe we may reckon only under gesture symbolism, consonants and vowels without that fundamental tone which is necessary above all else, are nothing but positions of the organs of speech, in short, gestures, as soon as we imagine the word proceeding out of the mouth of man. Then first of all the root of the word, and the basis of that gesture symbolism, the tonal subsoil, the echo of the pleasure and displeasure sensations originate. As our whole corporeality stands in relation to that original phenomenon, the will, so the word built out of its consonants and vowels stands in relation to its tonal basis. This original phenomenon, the will, with its scale of pleasure and displeasure sensations attains in the development of music an ever more adequate symbolic expression, and to this historical process the continuous effort of lyric poetry runs parallel, the effort to transcribe music into metaphors, exactly as this double phenomenon, according to the just completed disquisition, lies typified in language. He who has followed us into these difficult contemplations readily, attentively, and with some imagination, and with kind indulgence where the expression has been too scanty or too unconditional, will now have the advantage with us, of laying before himself more seriously and answering more deeply than is usually the case some stirring points of controversy of present day aesthetics and still more of contemporary artists. Let us think now, after all our assumptions, what an undertaking it must be, to set music to a poem i.e., to illustrate a poem by music, in order to help music thereby to obtain a language of ideas. What a perverted world! A task that appears to my mind like that of a son wanting to create his father. Music can create metaphors out of itself, which will always however be but schemata, instances as it were of her intrinsic general contents. But how should the metaphor, the conception, create music out of? itself. Much less could the idea, or, as one has said, the poetical idea do this. As certainly as a bridge leads out of the mysterious castle of the musician into the free land of the metaphors, and the lyric poet steps across it, as certainly is it impossible to go the contrary way, although some are said to exist who fancy they have done so. One might people the air with the fantasy of a Raphael, one might see street. Cecilia as he does, 
listening enraptured to the harmonies of the choirs of angels, no tone issues from this world apparently lost in music, even if we imagined that that harmony in reality, as by a miracle, began to sound for us, whither would Cecilia, Paul and Magdalena disappear from us, whither even the singing choir of angels. We should at once cease to be Raphael, and as in that picture the earthly instruments lie shattered on the ground, so our painter's vision, defeated by the higher, would fade and die away. How nevertheless could the miracle happen? How should the Apollonian world of the eye quite engrossed in contemplation be able to create out of itself the tone, which on the contrary symbolizes a sphere which is excluded and conquered just by that very Apollonian absorption in appearance? The delight at appearance cannot raise out of itself the pleasure at non-appearance, the delight of perceiving is delight only by the fact that nothing reminds us of a sphere in which individuation is broken and abolished. If we have characterized at all correctly the Apollonian in opposition to the Dionysine, then the thought which attributes to the metaphor, the idea, the appearance, in some way the power of producing out of itself the tone, must appear to us strangely wrong. We will not be referred, in order to be refuted, to the musician who writes music to existing lyric poems, for after all that has been said we shall be compelled to assert that the relationship between the lyric poem and its setting must in any case be a different one from that between a father and his child. Then what exactly? Here now we may be met on the ground of a favorite aesthetic notion with the proposition, it is not the poem which gives birth to the setting but the sentiment created by the poem. I do not agree with that. The more subtle or powerful stirring up of that pleasure and displeasure subsoil is in the realm of productive art the element which is inartistic in itself, indeed only its total exclusion makes the complete self-absorption and disinterested perception of the artist possible. Here perhaps one might retaliate that I myself just now predicated about the will, that in music will came to an even more adequate symbolic expression. My answer, condensed into an aesthetic axiom is this, the will is the object of music but not the origin of it, that is the will in its very greatest universality, as the most original manifestation, under which is to be understood all becoming. That, which we call feeling, is with regard to this will already permeated and saturated with conscious and unconscious conceptions and is therefore no longer directly the object of music. It is unthinkable then that these feelings should be able to create music out of themselves. Take for instance, the feelings of love, fear and hope, music can no longer do anything with them in a direct way, every one of them is already so filled with conceptions. On the contrary these feelings can serve to symbolize music, as the lyric poet does who translates for himself into the simile world of feelings that conceptually and metaphorically unapproachable realm of the will the proper content and object of music. The lyric poet resembles all those hearers of music who are conscious of an effect of music on their emotions, the distant and removed power of music appeals, with them, to an intermediate realm which gives to them as it were a foretaste, a symbolic preliminary conception of music proper, it appeals to the intermediate realm of the emotions. One might be permitted to say about them, with respect to the will, the only object of music, that they bear the same relation to this will, as the analogous morning dream, according to Schopenhauer's theory, bears to the dream proper. To all those, however, who are unable to get at music except with their emotions, is to be said, that they will ever remain in the entrance hall, and will never have access to the sanctuary of music, which, as I said, emotion cannot show but only symbolize. With regard however to the origin of music, I have already explained that that can never lie in the will, but must rather rest in the lap of that force, which under the form of the will creates out of itself a visionary world, the origin of music lies beyond all individuation, a proposition, which after our discussion on the Dionysian is self-evident. At this point I take the liberty of setting forth again comprehensively side by side those decisive propositions which the antithesis of the Dionysian and Apollonian dealt with has compelled us to enunciate. The will, as the most original manifestation, is the object of music, in this sense music can be called imitation of nature, 
but of nature in its most general form. The will itself and the feelings, manifestations of the will already permeated with conceptions, are wholly incapable of creating music out of themselves, just as on the other hand it is utterly denied to music to represent feelings, or to have feelings as its object, while will is its only object. He who carries away feelings as effects of music has within them as it were a symbolic intermediate realm, which can give him a foretaste of music, but excludes him at the same time from her innermost sanctuaries. The lyric poet interprets music to himself through the symbolic world of emotions, whereas he himself, in the calm of the Apollonian contemplation, is exempted from those emotions. When, therefore, the musician writes a setting to a lyric poem he is moved as musician neither through the images nor through the emotional language in the text, but a musical inspiration coming from quite a different sphere chooses for itself that song text as allegorical expression. There cannot therefore be any question as to a necessary relation between poem and music, for the two worlds brought here into connection are too strange to one another to enter into more than a superficial alliance. The song text is just a symbol and stands to music in the same relation as the Egyptian hieroglyph of bravery did to the brave warrior himself. During the highest revelations of music we even feel involuntarily the crudeness of every figurative effort and of every emotion dragged in for purposes of analogy. For example, the last quartets of Beethoven quite put to shame all illustration and the entire realm of empiric reality. The symbol in face of the God really revealing himself, has no longer any meaning, moreover it appears as an offensive superficiality. One must not think any the worse of us for considering from this point of view one item so that we may speak about it without reserve, namely the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, a movement which is unprecedented and unanalysable in its charms. To the dithyrambic world redeeming exaltation of this music Schiller's poem, to joy, is wholly incongruous, yea, like cold moonlight, pales beside that sea of flame. Who would rob me of this sure feeling? Why yea, who would be able to dispute that that feeling during the hearing of this music does not find expression in a scream only because we, wholly impotent through music for metaphor and word, already hear nothing at all from Schiller's poem. All that noble sublimity, yea the grandeur of Schiller's verses has, beside the truly naive innocent folk melody of joy, a disturbing, troubling, even crude and offensive effect, only the ever fuller development of the choir's song and the masses of the orchestra preventing us from hearing them, keep from us that sensation of incongruity. What therefore shall we think of that awful aesthetic superstition that Beethoven himself made a solemn statement as to his belief in the limits of absolute music, in that fourth movement of the ninth symphony, yea that he as it were with it unlocked the portals of a new art, within which music had been enabled to represent even metaphor and idea and whereby music had been opened to the conscious mind. And what does Beethoven himself tell us when he has choir song introduced by a recitative? Alas friends, let us intonate not these tones but more pleasing and joyous ones. More pleasing and joyous ones. For that he needed the convincing tone of the human voice, for that he needed the music of innocence in the folk song. Not the word, but the more pleasing sound not the idea but the most heartfelt joyful tone was chosen by the sublime master in his longing for the most soul-thrilling ensemble of his orchestra. And how could one misunderstand him? Rather may the same be said of this movement as Richard Wagner says of the great Missa Solemnis, which he calls a pure symphonic work of the most genuine Beethoven spirit, Beethoven, p. 42. The voices are treated here quite in the sense of human instruments in which sense Schopenhauer quite rightly wanted these human voices to be. Considered, the text underlying them is understood by us in these great church compositions, not in its conceptual meaning, but it serves in the sense of the musical work of art, merely as material for vocal music and does not stand to our musically determined sensation in a disturbing position simply because it does not incite in us any rational conceptions but, as its ecclesiastical character conditions too, only touches us with the impression of well-known symbolic creeds. 
Besides I do not doubt that Beethoven, had he written the Tenth Symphony, of which drafts are still extant, would have composed just the Tenth Symphony. Let us now approach, after these preparations, the discussion of the opera, so as to be able to proceed afterwards from the opera to its counterpart in the Greek tragedy. What we had to observe in the last movement of the Ninth, i.e., on the highest level of modern music development, viz., that the word content goes down unheard in the general sea of sound, is nothing isolated and peculiar, but the general and eternally valid norm in the vocal music of all times, the norm which alone is adequate to the origin of lyrics song. The man in a state of Dionysian excitement has a listener just as little as the orgiastic crowd, a listener to whom he might have something to communicate, a listener as the epic narrator and generally speaking the Apollonian artist, to be sure, presupposes. It is rather in the nature of the Dionysian art, that it has no consideration for the listener, the inspired servant of Dionysos is, as I said in a former place, understood only by his compeers. But if we now imagine a listener at those endemic outbursts of Dionysian excitement then we shall have to prophesy for him a fate similar to that which Pentheus the discovered eavesdropper suffered, namely, to be torn to pieces by the menads. The lyric musician sings. As the bird sings, alone, out of innermost compulsion, when the listener comes to him with a demand he must become dumb. A reference to Goethe's ballad, The Minstrel, Street 5. I sing as sings the bird, whose note. The leafy bough is heard on. The song that falters from my throat. For me is ample guerdon. Tr. Therefore it would be altogether unnatural to ask from the lyric musician that one should also understand the text words of his song, unnatural because here a demand is made by the listener, who has no right at all during the lyric outburst to claim anything. Now with the poetry of the great ancient lyric poets in your hand, put the question honestly to yourself whether they can have even thought of making themselves clear to the mass of the people standing around and listening, clear with their world of metaphors and thoughts, answer this serious question with a look at Pindar and the Aeschylean choir songs. These most daring and obscure intricacies of thought, this whirl of metaphors, ever impetuously reproducing itself, this oracular tone of the whole, which we, without the diversion of music and orchestration, so often cannot penetrate even with the closest attention, was this whole world of miracles transparent as glass to the Greek crowd, yea, a metaphorical conceptual interpretation of music? And with such mysteries of thought as are to be found in Pindar do you think the wonderful poet could have wished to elucidate the music already strikingly distinct? Should we here not be forced to an insight into the very nature of the lyricist, the artistic man, who to himself must interpret music through the symbolism of metaphors and emotions, but who has nothing to communicate to the listener, an artist who, in complete aloofness, even forgets those who stand eagerly listening near him. And as the lyricist his hymns, so the people sing the folk song, for themselves, out of inmost impulse unconcerned whether the word is comprehensible to him who does not join in the song. Let us think of our own experiences in the realm of higher art music, what did we understand of the text of a mass of Palestrina, of a cantato of Bach, of an oratorio of Handel, if we ourselves perhaps did not join in singing? Only for him who joins in singing do lyric poetry and vocal music exist, the listener stands before it as before absolute music. But now the opera begins, according to the clearest testimonies, with the demand of the listener to understand the word. What? The listener demands? The word is to be understood? But to bring music into the service of a series of metaphors and conceptions, to use it as a means to an end, to the strengthening and elucidation of such conceptions and metaphors, such a peculiar presumption as is found in the concept of an opera reminds me of that ridiculous person who endeavours to lift himself up into the air with his own arms, that which this fool and which the opera according to that idea attempt are absolute impossibilities. That idea of the opera does not demand perhaps an abuse from music but, as I said, an impossibility. Music never can become a means, one may push, screw, torture it, 
as tone, as roll of the drum, in its crudest and simplest stages, it still defeats poetry and abases the latter to its reflection. The opera as a species of art according to that concept is therefore not only an aberration of music, but an erroneous conception of aesthetics. If I here with, after all, justify the nature of the opera for aesthetics, I am of course far from justifying at the same time bad opera music or bad opera verses. The worst music can still mean, as compared with the best poetry, the Dionysian world subsoil, and the worst poetry can be mirror, image and reflection of this subsoil, if together with the best music, as certainly, namely, as the single tone against the metaphor is already Dionysian, and the single metaphor together with idea and word against music is already Apollonian. Yea, even bad music together with bad poetry can still inform us to the nature of music and poesy. When therefore Schopenhauer felt Bellini's Norma, for example, as the fulfillment of tragedy, with regard to that opera's music and poetry, then he, in Dionysian Apollonian emotion and self-forgetfulness, was quite entitled to do so, because he perceived music and poetry in their most general, as it were, philosophical value, as music and poetry, but with that judgment he showed a poorly educated taste. For good taste always has historical perspective. To us, who intentionally in this investigation avoid any question of the historic value of an art phenomenon and endeavor to focus only the phenomenon itself, in its unaltered eternal meaning, and consequently in its highest type, too, to us the art species of there. Opera seems to be justified as much as the folk song, insofar as we find in both that union of the Dionysian and Apollonian and are permitted to assume for the opera, namely for the highest type of the opera an origin analogous to that of the folk song. Only in so far as the opera historically known to us has a completely different origin from that of the folk song do we reject this opera, which stands in the same relation to that generic notion just defended by us, as the marionette does to a living human being. It is certain, music never can become a means in the service of the text, but must always defeat the text. Yet music must become bad when the composer interrupts every Dionysian force rising within himself by an anxious regard for the words and gestures of his marionettes. If the poet of the opera text has offered him nothing more than the usual schematized figures with their Egyptian regularity, then the freer, more unconditional, more Dionysian is the development of the music, and the more she despises all dramatic requirements, so much the higher will be the value of the opera. In this sense it is true the opera is, at its best, good music, and nothing but music, whereas the jugglery performed at the same time is, as it were, only a fantastic disguise of the orchestra, above all, of the most important instruments the orchestra has, the singers, and from this jugglery the judicious listener turns away laughing. If the mass is diverted by this very jugglery and only permits the music with it, then the mob fares as all those do who value the frame of a good picture higher than the picture itself. Who treats such naive aberrations with a serious or even pathetic reproach? But what will the opera mean as dramatic music, in its possibly farthest distance from pure music, efficient in itself, and purely Dionysian? Let us imagine a passionate drama full of incidents which carries away the spectator, and which is already sure of success by its plot, what will dramatic music be able to add, if it does not take away something? Firstly, it will take away much, for in every moment where for once the Dionysian power of music strikes the listener, the eye is dimmed that sees the action, the eye that became absorbed in the individuals appearing before it, the listener now forgets the drama and becomes alive again to it only when the Dionysian spell over him has been broken. In so far, however, as music makes the listener forget the drama, it is not yet dramatic music, but what kind of music is that which is not allowed to exercise any Dionysian power over the listener? And how is it possible? It is possible as purely conventional symbolism, out of which convention has sucked all natural strength, as music which has diminished to symbols of remembrance, and its effect aims at reminding the spectator of something which at the sight of the drama must not escape him lest he should misunderstand it, 
as a trumpet signal is an invitation for the horse to trot. Lastly, before the drama commenced and in interludes or during tedious passages, doubtful as to dramatic effect, yea, even in its highest moments, there would still be permitted another species of remembrance music, no longer purely conventional, namely emotional music, music, as a stimulant to dull or wearied nerves. I am able to distinguish in the so-called dramatic music these two elements only, a conventional rhetoric and remembrance music, and a sensational music with an effect essentially physical, and thus it vacillates between the noise of the drum and the signal horn, like the mood of the warrior who goes into the battle. But now the mind, regaling itself on pure music and educated through comparison demands a masquerade for those two wrong tendencies of music remembrance and emotion are to be played, but in good music, which must be in itself enjoyable, yea, valuable, what despair for the dramatic musician, who must mask the big drum by good music, which, however, must nevertheless have no purely musical, but only a stimulating effect. And now comes the great Philistine public nodding its thousand heads and enjoys this dramatic music which is ever ashamed of itself enjoys it to the very last morsel, without perceiving anything of its shame and embarrassment. Rather the public feels its skin agreeably tickled, for indeed homage is being rendered in all forms and ways to the public. To the pleasure-hunting, dull-eyed sensualist, who needs excitement, to the conceited educated person who has accustomed himself to good drama and good music as to good food, without after all making much out of it to the forgetful and absent-minded egoist, who must be led back to the work of art with force and with signal horns because selfish plans continually pass through his mind aiming at gain or pleasure. Woe begone dramatic musicians! Draw near and view your patrons. Faces. The half are coarse, the half are cold. Why should you rack, poor foolish bards, for ends like these the gracious muses? A quotation from Goethe's Faust, Part 1, Lines 91, 92, and 95, 96. Tr, and that the muses are tormented, even tortured and flayed, these voracious miserable ones do not themselves deny. We had assumed a passionate drama, carrying away the spectator, which even without music would be sure of its effect. I fear that that in it which is poetry and not action proper will stand in relation to true poetry as dramatic music to music in general, it will be remembrance and emotional poetry. Poetry will serve as a means, in order to recall in a conventional fashion feelings and passions, the expression of which has been found by real poets and has become celebrated, yea, normal with them. Further. This poetry will be expected in dangerous moments to assist the proper action, whether a criminalistic horror story or an exhibition of witchery mad with shifting the scenes, and to spread a covering veil over the crudeness of the action itself. Shamefully conscious, that the poetry is only masquerade which cannot bear the light of day, such a dramatic rhyme jingle clamors now for dramatic music as on the other hand again the poetaster of such dramas is met after one-fourth of the way by the dramatic musician with his talent for the drum and the signal horn and his shyness of genuine music, trusting in itself and self-sufficient. And now they see one another, and these Apollonian and Dionysian caricatures, this Parnobile fratrum, embrace one another. The relation between a scope and herian philosophy and a German culture translated by Maximilian A. Mug. Preface to an Unwritten Book, 1872. In dear Val Germany culture now lies so decayed in the streets, jealousy of all that is great rules so shamelessly, and the general tumult of those who race for fortune resounds so deafeningly, that one must have a strong faith, almost in the sense of credo queer absurdumist, in order to hope still for a growing culture and above all, in opposition to the press with her public opinion, to be able to work by public teaching. With violence must those, in whose hearts lies the immortal care for the people, free themselves from all the inrushing impressions of that which is just now actual and valid, and evoke the appearance of reckoning them in different things. They must appear so, because they want to think, and because a loathsome sight and a confused noise, 
perhaps even mixed with the trumpet flourishes of war glory, disturb their thinking, and above all, because they want to believe in the German character and because with this faith they would lose their strength. Do not find fault with these believers if they look from their distant aloofness and from the heights towards their promised land. They fear those experiences, to which the kindly disposed foreigner surrenders himself, when he lives among the Germans, and must be surprised how little German life corresponds to those great individuals, works and actions, which, in his kind disposition he has learned to revere as the true German character. Where the German cannot lift himself into the sublime he makes an impression less than the mediocre. Even the celebrated German scholarship, in which a number of the most useful domestic and homely virtues such as faithfulness, self-restriction, industry, moderation, cleanliness appear transposed into a purer atmosphere and, as it were, transfigured, is by no means the result of these virtues, looked at closely, the motive urging to unlimited knowledge appears in Germany much more like a defect, a gap, than an abundance of forces. It looks almost like the consequence of a needy formless atrophied life and even like a flight from the moral narrow-mindedness and malice to which the German without such diversions is subjected, and which also in spite of that scholarship, yea still within scholarship itself, often break forth. As the true virtuosi of Philistines and the Germans are at home in narrowness of life, discerning and judging, if any one will carry them above themselves into the sublime, then they make themselves heavy as lead, and as such lead weights they hang to their truly great men, in order to pull them down out of the ether to the level of their own necessitous indigence. Perhaps this Philistine homeliness may be only the degeneration of a genuine German virtue, a profound submersion into the detail, the minute, the nearest and into the mysteries of the individual, but this virtue grown mouldy is now worse than the most open vice especially since one has now become conscious, with gladness of the heart, of this quality, even to literary self-glorification. Now the educated among the proverbially so cultured Germans and their Philistines among their, as everybody knows, so uncultured Germans shake hands in public and agree with one another concerning the way in which henceforth one will have to write, compose poetry, paint, make music and even philosophize yea, rule, so as neither to stand too much aloof from the culture of the one, nor to give offence to the homeliness of the other. This they call now the German culture of our times. Well, it is only necessary to inquire after the characteristic by which that educated person is to be recognized, now that we know that his foster brother, the German Philistine, makes himself known as such to all the world, without bashfulness, as it were, after innocence is lost. The educated person nowadays is educated above all historically, by his historic consciousness he saves himself from the sublime in which the Philistine succeeds by his homeliness. No longer that enthusiasm which history inspires, as Goethe was allowed to suppose, but just the blunting of all enthusiasm is now the goal of these admirers of the Nil Admirari, when they try to conceive everything historically, to them however we should exclaim, ye are the fools of all centuries. History will make to you only those confessions, which you are worthy to receive. The world has been at all times full of trivialities and non-entities, to your historic hankering just these and only these unveil themselves. By your thousands you may pounce upon an epoch, you will afterwards hunger as before and be allowed to boast of your sort of starved soundness. Illum ipsum quam ectanal sanitatum non firmatates de unio consequentia. Dialogus du oratribus, cap. 25. History has not thought fit to tell you anything that is essential, but scorning and invisible she stood by your side, slipping into this one's hand some state proceedings, into that one's an ambassadorial report, into another's a date or an etymology or a pragmatic cobweb. Do you really believe yourself able to reckon up history like an addition sum, and do you consider your common intellect and your mathematical education good enough for that? How it must vex you to hear, that others narrate things, out of the best known periods, which you will never conceive, never. If now to this education, 
calling itself historic but destitute of enthusiasm, and to the hostile Philistine activity, foaming with rage against all that is great, is added that third brutal and excited company of those who race after fortune, then that in summer results in such a confused shrieking and such a limb dislocating turmoil that the thinker with stopped up ears and blindfolded eyes flees into the most solitary wilderness, where he may see, what those never will see where he must hear sounds which rise to him out of all the depths of nature and come down to him from the stars. Here he confers with the great problems floating towards him, whose voices of course sound just as comfortless awful, as unhistoric eternal. The feeble person flees back from their cold breath, and the calculating one runs right through them without perceiving them. They deal worst, however, with the educated man who at times bestows great pains upon them. To him these phantoms transform themselves into conceptual cobwebs and hollow sound figures. Grasping after them he imagines he has philosophy, in order to search for them he climbs about in the so-called history of philosophy, and when at last he has collected and piled up quite a cloud of such abstractions and stereotyped patterns, then it may happen to him that a real thinker crosses his path and, puffs them away. What a desperate annoyance indeed to meddle with philosophy as an educated person. From time to time it is true it appears to him as if the impossible connection of philosophy with that which nowadays gives itself airs as German culture has become possible, some mongrel dallies and ogles between the two spheres and confuses fantasy on this side and on the other. Meanwhile however one piece of advice is to be given to the Germans, if they do not wish to let themselves be confused. They may put to themselves the question about everything that they now call culture, is this the hoped for German culture, so serious and creative, so redeeming for the German mind, so purifying for the German virtues that their only philosopher in this century, Arthur Schopenhauer, should have to espouse its cause? Here you have the philosopher, now search for the culture proper to him. And if you are able to divine what kind of culture that would have to be, which would correspond to such a philosopher, then you have, in this divination, already passed sentence on all your culture and on yourselves. Homer's Contest Translated by Maximilian A. Mug Preface to an Unwritten Book, 1872 When one speaks of humanity the notion lies at the bottom that humanity is that which separates and distinguishes man from nature. But such a distinction does not in reality exist, the natural qualities and the properly called human ones have grown up inseparably together. Man in his highest and noblest capacities is nature and bears in himself her awful twofold character. His abilities generally considered dreadful and inhuman are perhaps indeed the fertile soil out of which alone can grow forth all humanity in emotions, actions and works. Thus the Greeks, the most humane men, mention, of ancient times, have in themselves a trait of cruelty, of tiger-like pleasure in destruction, a trait, which in the grotesquely magnified image of the Hellene, in Alexander the Great, is very plainly visible, which, however, in their whole history, as well as in their mythology, must terrify us who meet them with the emasculate idea of modern humanity. When Alexander has the feet of Battis, the brave defender of Gaza, bored through, and binds the living body to his chariot in order to drag him about exposed to the scorn of his soldiers, that is a sickening caricature of Achilles, who at night he uses Hector's corpse by a similar trailing, but even this trait has for us something offensive, something which inspires horror, it gives us a peep into the abysses of hatred. With the same sensation perhaps we stand before the bloody and insatiable self-laceration of two Greek parties, as for example in the Corsirian Revolution. When the victor, in a fight of the cities, according to the law of warfare, executes the whole male population and sells all the women and children into slavery, we see, in the sanction of such a law, that the Greek deemed it a positive necessity to allow his hatred to break forth unimpeded, in such moments the compressed and swollen feeling relieved itself, the tiger bounded forth, a voluptuous cruelty shone out of his fearful eye. 
Why had the Greek sculptor to represent again and again war and fights and innumerable repetitions, extended human bodies whose sinews are tightened through hatred or through the recklessness of triumph, fighters wounded and writhing with pain, or the dying with the last rattle in their throat? Why did the whole Greek world exult in the fighting scenes of the Iliad? I am afraid, we do not understand them enough in Greek fashion, and that we should even shudder if for once we did understand them thus. But what lies, as the womb of the Hellenic, behind the Homeric world? In the latter, by the extremely artistic definiteness, and the calm and purity of the lines we are already lifted far above the purely material amalgamation, its colors, by an artistic deception, appear lighter, milder, warmer, its men, in this colored, warm illumination, appear better and more sympathetic, but where do we look, if, no longer guided and protected by Homer's hand, we step backwards into the pre-Homeric world. Only the night and horror, into the products of a fancy accustomed to the horrible. What earthly existence is reflected in the loathsome awful Theogonian law, a life swayed only the children of the night, strife, amorous desires, deception, age and death. Let us imagine the suffocating atmosphere of Hesiod's poem, still thickened and darkened and without the mitigations and purifications, which poured over Hellas from Delphi and the numerous seats of the gods. If we mix this thickened bursting air with the grim voluptuousness of the Etruscans, then such a reality would extort from us a world of myths within which Uranus, Kronos and Zeus and the struggles of the Titans would appear as a relief. Combat in this brooding atmosphere is salvation and safety, the cruelty of victory is the summit of life's glories. And just as in truth the idea of Greek law has developed from murder and expiation of murder, so also nobler civilization takes her first treath of victory from the altar of the expiation of murder. Behind that bloody age stretches a wave furrow deep into Hellenic history. The names of Orpheus, of Musius, and their cults indicate to what consequences the uninterrupted sight of a world of warfare and cruelty led, to the loathing of existence, to the conception of this existence as a punishment to be born to the end, to the belief in the identify of existence and indebtedness. But these particular conclusions are not specifically Hellenic, through them Greece comes into contact with India and the Orient generally. The Hellenic genius had ready yet another answer to the question. What does a life of fighting and of victory mean? And gives this answer in the whole breadth of Greek history. In order to understand the latter, we must start from the fact that the Greek genius admitted the existing fearful impulse, and deemed it justified, whereas in the Orphic phase of thought was contained the belief that life with such an impulse as its root would not be worth living. Strife and the pleasure of victory were acknowledged and nothing separates the Greek world more from ours than the colouring, derived hence, of some ethical ideas, for example, of Eris and of Envy. When the traveller Pausanias during his wanderings through Greece visited the Helicon, a very old copy of the first didactic poem of the Greeks, Hesiod's The Works and Days, was shown to him. Inscribed upon plates of lead and severely damaged by time and weather, However he recognized this much, that, unlike the usual copies it had not at its head that little hymnus on Zeus, but began at once with the declaration, two Eris goddesses are on earth. This is one of the most noteworthy Hellenic thoughts and worthy to be impressed on the newcomer immediately at the entrance gate of Greek ethics. One would like to praise the one Eris, just as much as to blame the other, of one uses one's reason for these two goddesses have quite different dispositions. For the one, the cruel one, furthers the evil war and feud. No mortal likes her, but under the yoke of need one pays honor to the burden Cyrus, according to the decree of the immortals. She, as the elder, gave birth to Black Knight. Zeus the high ruling one, however, placed the other Eris upon the roots of the earth and among men as a much better one. She urges even the unskilled man to work, and if one who lacks property beholds another who is rich, then he hastens to sow in similar fashion and to plant and to put his house in order, the neighbor vies with the neighbor who strives after fortune. Good is this heiress to men. 
the potter also has a grudge against the potter, and the carpenter against the carpenter, the beggar envies the beggar, and the singer the singer. The two last verses which treat of the odium figulinum appear to our scholars to be incomprehensible in this place. According to their judgment the predicates, grudge and envy fit only the nature of the evil eris, and for this reason they do not hesitate to designate these verses as spurious or thrown by chance into this place. For that judgment however a system of ethics other than the Hellenic must have inspired these scholars unawares, for in these verses to the good Eris Aristotle finds no offence. And not only Aristotle but the whole Greek antiquity thinks of spite and envy otherwise than we do and agrees with Hesiod, who first designates as an evil one that Eris who leads men against one another to a hostile war of extermination, and secondly praises another Eris as the good one, who has jealousy, spite, envy, incites men to activity but not to the action of war to the knife but the action of competition. The Greek is envious and conceives of this quality not as a blemish, but as the effect of a beneficent deity. What a gulf of ethical judgment between us and him! Because he is envious he also feels, with every superfluity of honour, riches, splendour and fortune, the envious eye of a god resting on himself, and he fears this envy, in this case the latter reminds him of the transitoriness of every human lot, he dreads his very happiness and, sacrificing the best of it, he bows before the divine envy. This conception does not perhaps estrange him from his gods, their significance on the contrary is expressed by the thought that with them man in whose soul jealousy is enkindled against every other living being, is never allowed to venture into competition. In the fight of Tamiris with the Muses, of Marsyas with Apollo, in the heart-moving fate of Niobe appears the horrible opposition of the two powers, who must never fight with one another, men and God. The greater and more sublime however a Greek is, the brighter in him appears the ambitious flame, devouring everybody who runs with him on the same track. Aristotle once made a list of such competitions on a large scale, among them is the most striking instance how even a dead person can still incite a living one to consuming jealousy. Thus for example Aristotle designates the relation between the Colophonian Xenophanes and Homer. We do not understand this attack on the national hero of poetry in all its strength, if we do not imagine, as later on also with Plato, the root of this attack to be the ardent desire to step into the place of the overthrown poet and to inherit his fame. Every great Hellene hands on the torch of the competition, at every great virtue a new light is kindled. If the young Themistocles could not sleep at the thought of the laurels of mill shades so his early awakened bent released itself only in the long emulation with Aristides in that uniquely noteworthy, purely instinctive genius of his political activity, which Thucydides describes. How characteristic are both question and answer, when a notable opponent of Pericles is asked, whether he or Pericles was the better wrestler in the city, and he gives the answer. Even if I throw him down he denies that he has fallen, attains his purpose and convinces those who saw him fall. If one wants to see that sentiment unashamed in its naive expressions, the sentiment as to the necessity of competition lest the state's welfare be threatened, one should think of the original meaning of ostracism, as for example the Ephesians pronounced it at the banishment of Hermidor. Among us nobody shall be the best. If however someone is the best, then let him be so elsewhere and among others. Heraclitus. Why should not someone be the best? Because with that the competition would fail, and the eternal life basis of the Hellenic state would be endangered. Later on ostracism receives quite another position with regard to competition, it is applied, when the danger becomes obvious that one of the great competing politicians and party leaders feels himself urged on in the heat of the conflict towards harmful and destructive measures and dubious coups d'etat. The original sense of this peculiar institution however is not that of a safety valve but that of a stimulant. The all-excelling individual was to be removed in order that the competition of forces might reawaken, a thought which is hostile to the exclusiveness of genius in the modern sense but which assumes that in the natural order of things there are always several geniuses which incite one another to action, 
as much also as they hold one another within the bounds of moderation. That is the kernel of the Hellenic competition conception, it abominates autocracy, and fears its dangers, it desires as a preventive against the genius, a second genius. Every natural gift must develop itself by competition. Thus the Hellenic national pedagogy demands, whereas modern educators fear nothing as much as the unchaining of the so-called ambition. Here one fears selfishness as the evil in itself, with the exception of the Jesuits, who agree with the ancients and who, possibly, for that reason, are the most efficient educators of our time. They seem to believe that selfishness, that is, the individual element is only the most powerful agents but that it obtains its character as good and evil essentially from the aims towards which it strives. To the ancients however the aim of the agonistic education was the welfare of the whole, of the civic society. Every Athenian, for instance, was to cultivate his ego in competition, so far that it should be of the highest service to Athens and should do the least harm. It was not unmeasured and immeasurable as modern ambition generally is, the youth thought of the welfare of his native town when he vied with others in running, throwing or singing, it was her glory that he wanted to increase with his own, it was to his town's gods that he dedicated the wreaths which the umpires as a mark of honor set upon his head. Every Greek from childhood felt within himself the burning wish to be in the competition of the towns as an instrument for the welfare of his own town. In this his selfishness was kindled into flame, by this his selfishness was bridled and restricted. Therefore the individuals in antiquity were freer, because their aims were nearer and more tangible. Modern man, on the contrary, is everywhere hampered by infinity, like the fleet-footed Achilles in the allegory of the Iliad Zeno, infinity impedes him, he does not even overtake the tortoise. But as the youths to be educated were brought up struggling against one another, so their educators were in turn in emulation amongst themselves. Distrustfully jealous, the great musical masters, Pindar and Simonides, stepped side by side, in rivalry the sophist, the higher teacher of antiquity meets his fellow sophist, even the most universal kind of instruction, through the drama, was imparted to the people only under the form of an enormous wrestling of the great musical and dramatic artists. How wonderful! And even the artist has a grudge against the artist. And the modern man dislikes in an artist nothing so much as the personal battle feeling, whereas the Greek recognizes the artist only in such a personal struggle. There were the modern suspects weakness of the work of art, the Hellene seeks the source of his highest strength. That which by way of example in Plato is of special artistic importance in his dialogues, is usually the result of an emulation with the art of the orators, of the sophists, of the dramatists of his time, invented deliberately in order that at the end he could say, Behold, I can also do what my great rivals can, yea I can do it even better than they. No Protagoras has composed such beautiful myths as I, no dramatist such a spirited and fascinating whole as the Symposium, no orator penned such an oration as I put up in the Gorgias, and now I reject all that together and condemn all imitative art. Only the competition made me a poet, a sophist, an orator. What a problem unfolds itself there before us, if we ask about the relationship between the competition and the conception of the work of art. If on the other hand we remove the competition from Greek life, then we look at once into the pre-Homeric abyss of horrible savagery, hatred, and pleasure in destruction. This phenomenon alas, shows itself frequently when a great personality was, owing to an enormously brilliant deed, suddenly withdrawn from the competition and became more de according to his, and his fellow citizens. Judgment Almost without exception the effect is awful, and if one usually draws from these consequences the conclusion that the Greek was unable to bear glory and fortune, one should say more exactly that he was unable to bear fame without further struggle, and fortune at the end of the competition. There is no more distinct instance than the fate of Milciades. Placed upon a solitary height and lifted far above every fellow combatant through his incomparable success at Marathon, 
he feels a low thirsting for revenge awakened within himself against a citizen of Para, with whom he had been at enmity long ago. To satisfy his desire he misuses reputation, the public exchequer and civic honor and disgraces himself. Conscious of his ill success he falls into unworthy machinations. He forms a clandestine and godless connection with Timo a priestess of Demeter, and enters at night the sacred temple, from which every man was excluded. After he has leapt over the wall and comes ever nearer the shrine of the goddess, the dreadful horror of a panic-like terror suddenly seizes him, almost prostrate and unconscious he feels himself driven back and leaping the wall once more, he falls down paralyzed and severely injured. The siege must be raised and a disgraceful death impresses its seal upon a brilliant heroic career, in order to darken it for all posterity. After the battle at Marathon the envy of the Celestials has caught him. And this divine envy breaks into flames when it beholds man without rival, without opponent, on the solitary height of glory. He now has beside him only the gods, and therefore he has them against him. These however betray him into a deed of the hybrid, and under it he collapses. Let us well observe that just as Milchiades perishes so the noblest Greek states perish when they, merit and fortune, have arrived from the race course at the temple of Nike. Athens, which had destroyed the independence of her allies and avenged with severity the rebellions of her subjected foes, Sparta which after the battle of Ego Spotamo used her preponderance over Hellas in a still harsher and more cruel fashion, both these, as in the case of Milchiades, brought about their ruin through deeds of the hybrid, as a proof that without envy, jealousy, and competing ambition the Hellenic state like the Hellenic man degenerates. He becomes bad and cruel, thirsting for revenge, and godless, in short, he becomes pre-Homeric, and then it needs only a panic in order to bring about his fall and to crush him. Sparta and Athens surrender to Persia, as Themistocles and Alcibiades have done, they betray Hellenism after they had given up the noblest Hellenic fundamental thought, the competition, and Alexander, the course and copy and abbreviation of Greek history, now invents the cosmopolitan Hellene, and the so-called Hellenism.